Welcome back, and great, great to have you here. I've, uh, I've had fun going through this book, and we're going to conclude it today by, by hook or by crook, or however they say it. Uh, we've got about a chapter and a half left. Um, so we're going to be starting at chapter 12, verse 14, I think it is. Uh, but I just wanted to review real quickly uh, where we're at. Everybody can see the verses okay? Is that right? Yeah? All right. So we started with talking about how Jesus is superior to angels. There. <laughs> you can see it? All yeah, right. Like Good. It. And then we talked about how Jesus became human um, and how he became our faithful high priest, how he's superior to Moses, and we are going to enter the eternal rest of heaven through Jesus, our high priest, the Melchizedek, the fulfillment of Melchizedek without beginning and without end, and how he's a priest forever in that order of Melchizedek. This book draws a lot on Old Testament imagery and showing how Jesus is the fulfillment who brings us into the most holy place of heaven. So the earthly tent compared to the heavenly tent, we get there through Jesus' blood, the one perfect sacrifice. His sacrifice is superior to the animal sacrifices, and his sacrifice is sufficient. So we can have confidence in Christ. And then, like in a lot of uh, Paul's books, you go from uh, this wonderful picture of grace then to what that grace means for us and how we live, not to keep on sinning, not to use God's grace as an excuse to sin, but to endure pa suffering patiently. Then he draws on the hall of faith and all of these people throughout the Old Testament who, according to this uh, book, are talking about living for heaven, not for earth. Um, so they ran with perseverance the race that God marked out for them, and we do that too. And we talked about having to endure the Lord's discipline as we wait for heaven. Um, so let's see here. Yeah, so that leads us to chapter 12, verse 14 today. And I'm going to start there. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Take care that no one falls short of God's grace, and no, no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and so defile many. Take care that no one becomes sexually immoral or worldly like Esau, who gave away his right as firstborn for a single meal. Certainly you know that afterward he was rejected when he wanted to inherit the blessing, for he found no chance to change his father's mind, even though he sought it with tears. Um, that reminds me, I should probably go back to the NIV version. Um, so I just switched over to the NIV version. So note again the extreme goals to be holy, okay? Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And I've mentioned this before, right? God does not just demand that we be good people. We need to be holy, and that's why we need Jesus and the grace of God in his sacrifice, his perfect life uh, that he lived for us, his um, active obedience under the law, and then his passive obedience by dying on the cross for us through faith in him and his life and his death. We have holiness in baptism and through faith in Jesus. So he says, make, uh, make every effort to be holy. And that means, well, how do we do that? By staying in the word, staying in the sacrament. Don't miss the grace of God. Uh, and that could happen by bitter roots growing up and causing trouble and defiling many. Um, I wanted to put in a cross reference here in Deuteronomy 29, verse 18. Talks about bitter root. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord, our God, to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces bitter poison. So it's uh, the devil is a god of poison right the false god of poison and the false god of bitterness and it it isn't hard for there to be bitterness in this world as you can see through the riots going on um there's a great 
bitter divide among us and that's happening more and more in our politics and in our race divisions. Just a, an inner anger, simmering anger at people, at the system, at the world. And that's satanic ultimately to have this bitterness inside. And that can happen also in the, in the Christian heart too. When you're not in the grace of God, then you're full of a desire to get even, to get justice, to get, to get, to get somebody, to get what's yours. You can think also of our, even within our justice system, uh, the desire to get your millions of dollars to sue this person and that person. And that, uh, that can grow up in the heart and cause trouble and defile many people. Um, he then mentions uh, Esau, the example of Esau. If you remember, uh, that was from uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 29. When Esau came in from the open country, he was famished and he wanted some red stew. And then Jacob said, first sell me my birthright. And he said, what good is it to me? So he swore to sell him his birthright to Jacob for some bread and some lentil stew. Now, Jacob obviously is known as the heel grabber. And he, if his brother really was starving to death, he probably should have just given him some. some but that doesn't excuse Esau so flippantly uh, selling his, his uh, birthright for some stew. I mean, I'm sure... If he made it back to the tent, he probably could have gotten some for himself, too. But that's the example there. Um, and there's another then uh, when he wanted the blessing then. Uh, he, he couldn't get it. Um, and, and Isaac would not bless him uh, the way that he blessed his his son, no matter how, his other son, no matter how much he begged for it. So that's the example from the scriptures it's referring to. Um, he says, and it's interesting that he uses that for um, sexual immorality. We don't have any record of that in connection with, with Esau. But um, you could maybe coordinate the two in instant desire, instant want that how they kind of co-mingle together, wanting what you want right now, regardless of the, the consequences. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe there's some similarity to that, um, a worldly godlessness that, uh, that Esau uh, seems to be portraying here in this. Uh, no matter how much he tried to change the mind of his father in this instance, he couldn't get the blessing back because of the way he had treated it earlier. Um, so that's the example that maybe you could have with the grace of God. If you treat it flippantly, if you sell it for what you want here and now, you may not be able to receive it back if, uh, if you continue to do that. 18 through 24 then, uh, goes on to this illustration of the mountain and who God is and how we approach him. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. But you've come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So in this illustration, when he talks about the mountain that can't be touched, he's referring back to um, the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus uh, 19 and 20, when they go to Mount Sinai and he tells the people, puts up a barrier, he says, don't come near the, near the, the, the mountain. 
And then he said, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. So God is setting Moses aside here, especially in this visit with Moses, so that when they saw Moses, they would have a healthy respect of him. And that's going to come to play later on when they try to stone Moses and Joshua. But he wanted them to, to fear God and also to respect Moses. So they put the limits around the mountain. And then on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. So imagine this huge loud trumpet blast from the top of the mountain and everybody tr trembled. There's thunder and lightning. And then they stood at the foot of the mountain as Moses led them there. And then the Lord descended on the mountain in fire. So the smoke is billowing up and the whole mountain is trembling violently. And the trumpet goes louder and louder. And then Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. So um, it was a terrifying scene as God then spoke himself. You know, we oftentimes think of Moses coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, but God, first of all, spoke those very words from the top of the mountain to the people. And that terrified the people to where it says, they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we'll listen, but don't have God speak to us or we will die. So he's referencing this whole instance then, okay? When we think about verse 18, this is what he's talking about when God first spoke from Mount Sinai, trying to bring about fear in the people so that they would realize they need to come to a different mountain, to the mountain of grace, to Mount Zion, Zion uh, where Jerusalem was built. And right outside of Jerusalem is where Jesus dies for the sins of the world. Um, it mentions here that... Um, the mountain shook, right? Um, and it talks about that. Uh, where was that? I can't, I can't see it here, but um, well, maybe that was in the Old Testament reference. Um, but it also refers to God as a consuming fire in Exodus 24, verse 17. And there's the burning with fire. So it represents the anger of God, the wrath of God. Um, in Second Samuel... 22 verse 9, uh, it's referenced, smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth, blazing coals blazed out of it, when he's re referencing God coming down. And so uh, it, that was David's song of praise he sang from in this Second Samuel, when God delivered him from his enemies, he references the power of God. And uh, this is also referenced in Psalm 18, uh, how God's smoke rose from his ink, his nostrils. So uh, he references that time and again in the Old Testament. And then um, when we go back to Hebrews 12, verse 28 here, um, he says, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So... He says, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Uh, think about that song we sing, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. He mentions that heaven then is a city with foundations. Uh, he's going to refer to that as, um, uh, let's see, oh, where is that? Uh, I can't find it here. But at any rate, um, that's what Mount Zion is, a city, a city with foundations that can't be, be shaken on the blood of Christ to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So um, it's a great reference or, or a contrast from one mountain to the other mountain the spirits of righteous men made perfect. So remember, in Jesus, we are made perfect. We, are, we do look perfect by the sprinkled blood. I, I think of baptism in that. 
and it's better than the blood of Abel that, that remember how we sing that Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the sky, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon cries. Um, so 25 through 28. Oh, here's the one. Once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. He's using that to refer to judgment day. I think ultimately when he comes Luther referred to that when the angels sung from heaven when Jesus was born, how the heavens were shook when Jesus came down from heaven. But then ultimately Jesus is going to come down from heaven with the angels and a trumpet call on judgment day as well uh, to judge the living and the dead. So um, there we have the second part of chapter 12. Any questions or comments on those verses at all? The crowd is silent. <laughs> all, right. all right. I will keep going. Let's see here. So now we're on to chapter 13. And, you know, I just love the, the thing that I love about this book, again, is the pictures that it draws and things. I'm going to turn on my air conditioner here. If this is too loud, just uh, tell me to turn it off again, and I'll sweat a little bit. But, uh, hopefully it's not too much of a roar for you. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 13 now, 1 through 3. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Don't forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. And remember those in, remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So in the last part of this chapter, you'll sometimes see this in Paul's letter as well. It just kind of goes through a litany of, of small little exhortations of things that he's wanting them to do. He mentions loving each other as brothers and don't forget to entertain strangers. A different society back then where they didn't have metropolises like we do nowadays. You would, uh, I would envision more a lot of them perhaps living out in the country and seeing people walk by was kind of a rare treat. Uh, sometimes people mention that back 30, 40 years ago when somebody would knock on the door, everybody would jump up excited and welcoming the person in, whoever it might be. And nowadays, everybody draws the shades and kind of peeks out the window and wonders who dares to knock on their door. Uh, it's definitely a change in our society. Uh, and there's reason for that because sometimes you have the door-to-door -door salesmen and aggressive things that, well, they're not as prominent now maybe as 10 or 15 years ago. But uh, we become more leery of strangers, obviously. Uh, but he says, don't forget to entertain them. And it's probably a reference then with the angels without knowing it. You could think of Sodom and Gomorrah when Lot took in the angels or even Abraham prior to that when he speaks to the three, the three men and they prophesy Sarah's uh, pregnancy. And one of those was the Lord, incar or Lord incarnate, but not permanently incarnate, visiting visiting Abraham with two, two angels that somehow were able to uh, uh, temporarily sort of take on flesh, as did with Lot as well. Um, so he says, you never know when you two might be entertaining uh, angels. I, you know, I've never personally talked with anybody who thought maybe the person that they were entertaining was an angel, but he says, uh, be open and welcome to that. Um, Paul, uh, Paul, remember, was one who suffered in prison quite a bit. He wrote many of his letters from prison, and during that time, Christians were being arrested and mistreated, and uh, it was important for them not to forget them when they were in prison. 2 Timothy 4, uh, verse 11, Paul talked about what was going on there. He said, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. And uh, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus of Troas and my scrolls, especially the, par the parchments. Um, 
So he mentions Demas here who deserted him and went to Thessalonica. So he really appreciated when people did visit or when they sent support. Think about just wanting a cloak to wear to keep him warm. He didn't even have that in prison. So um, in this text then he says, Re remember uh, those in prison. Remember means not only just to remember that they're in prison, but when that's used in the Bible, when God says, for, for instance, that I remembered them, doesn't mean that he forgot about them, but then he, he thinks about them, and now he's going to do something about it. So oftentimes when that word remember is used, he wants you not only to think about them, but do something for them. Uh, I did a prison ministry in Kansas at the state prison, and that was sometimes intimidating, but very rewarding. These men very much appreciated the Bible studies that were brought in. I also did one in uh, in Topeka when I was there at the county jail. Um, so those things were appreciated. And um, we actually in the Wells probably have the biggest prison ministry out of any of them. We have Bible studies and things that we've printed and we send to jails for the prisoners to do. And there's really quite a, uh, quite a, uh, ministry that we have through our special ministries for that. Verse 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Uh, sexual relations are for marriage. The marriage bed should be kept pure, and that's something that our society has forgotten. Um, sexual uh, relationships are very rare to be held off until marriage and that ruins a trust and it ruins the natural progression that uh, is supposed to take place in courtship and then reserving this this pleasure of sex for marriage so if you're keeping it pure the marriage bed it's talking about the sexual relationship and how do you honor marriage uh, honored by all so you're saying that this is a special thing that God has set aside for sexual relations, for trust between a, a, a husband and a wife, and it's a protection for both of them ultimately. And then it says, God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. So for someone to live together before marriage, have sexual relationships outside of marriage, God, he does not mince words. God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. These are sins to be repented of, not to be excused, because everybody else does it, and because they think that's fine. Uh, God is very clear on this in his word. And if you look even at cross-references, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 19, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. He seems to especially mention then the, the nature of a sexual sin is a sin against the body that God gave you, that the body that the Holy Spirit is living is living in and i've sometimes used the illustration of a if somebody had a skunk and they invited it into your home you would either have to leave or the skunk would have to leave so the holy spirit who is in you if you were to decide to take your body and, and commit sexual morality and continue to do this there would have to be a point where you would lose your faith ultimately, where you would be sinning against your own conscience and sinning against the Holy Spirit who is in you, trying to fight against your desires, and also then sinning against your own body where it could become an addictive type of a sin as well to where ultimately the Holy Spirit is not going to stick around forever when you willingly and physically uh, participate in a sin like that. So here he mentions the blessing of marriage, and we can't forget that, that the marriage is a blessing, and it, it is something to honor, not to make fun of, not to just poo-poo as just a piece of paper, but it should be honored. It's a, it's a high honor that God has designed marriage uh, between one man and one woman to have this 
wonderful union where they can live together and share each other and do all these things, but it should be honored within marriage and nothing else. So he mentions this here. And both of these sins uh, have to do, uh, we're going to talk about, have to do with greed in a sense. The, 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 it says here, keep your lives free from money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So if you're trusting God that he and you are cherishing the fact that he is with you and that he gives you what you have, what you need, then you, then you shouldn't feel like you need to cut corners or that you need to break his law for a relationship to be blessed. Um, you shouldn't feel like you need money to be happy when you have God's presence with you and his forgiveness with you. So wanting what God hasn't given yet is a source of greed, and wanting what God hasn't given you yet is a source of sexual immorality. Um, oftentimes these two sins go together. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler, with a man do not even eat. So here he has sexually immoral or greedy. There those two go together again. Okay, greedy people want what they want, when they want it, how they want it. And that's also a source of sexual immorality. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Sexual morality and greed go hand in hand. And then what is the, the, the antidote to greed and sexual immorality? Um, uh, well, here it says that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and, and and pierce themselves with many greed. Well, we go back to Hebrews chapter uh, 13, verse 4, and uh, we see uh, what he says here, be content with what you have. Uh, contentment, that's the secret of happiness, ultimately, is contentment, knowing that God will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So that's from Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Uh, and it says, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid of them. The Lord your God goes with you. That says they're entering into the promised land, and they have to face the giants and the people living there. Uh, he says, too, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Um, and that might sound contrary to what we said as far as sexual morality goes, but in this case, when we talk about your body being a temple of the Holy Spirit, it's not him leaving you, it's you leaving him ultimately with your behavior and chasing him out of you. So, but when you trust that God is with you, you trust that God will give you what you, what you need, that is a source of faith then. Um, and the same thing then, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what can man do to me? So the opposite of faith is fear. Uh, fear of men is the opposite of faith in God. All right, uh, any questions, comments on those verses at all? Um, Pastor, the part where he says, do not even eat with them. And I assume he's talking about people that are caught up in this sin, because I think back to Jesus, and he certainly ate with them. And, uh, you know, he, he was known for uh, being with the tax collectors, that sort of thing. But I assume there's a difference here. People who are caught up in that sin, um, that resist, yeah. resist him. Uh, in that context, he's talking about somebody who claims to be a brother, mm -hmm. strong Christian, you know, I'm one of your fellowship, and but I'm doing all these things on the side, right? Okay. Uh, as opposed to you're eating lunch with somebody who doesn't claim to be a Christian, and you're trying to bring them to the faith, 
there's a big difference between those two things. And out of loving discipline, you would say, I'm not going to condone what you're doing by eating with you and pretending everything's okay in our relationship with Jesus when you are openly doing these things and saying there's nothing wrong with it, okay? Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of person you don't eat with or say, it's all fine. It's not. And that's a part of what we're having in our problem with our Christian societies is that there's no discipline, right? There's this love that says, I don't want to chase you away. I'm not going to say you're doing anything wrong when you are doing something wrong and there's no repentance there then, right? Um, so not even eating with them is kind of a strong thing, right? I'm not going to share bread with you, but I don't want to give you the impression that what, what you're doing is okay and I, I, I've got to be firm with you in this. That's what we're talking about. So sometimes we would apply that to the Lord's Supper then, right? If somebody is... Uh, say decided to live with somebody before marriage and uh, they didn't want to repent of it or we'd say hey hold off we don't want you coming to the Lord's Supper right now until you show some signs of repentance and you want to work this out right that's that's where that comes in okay yep. anybody else mm -mm. all right let's go back to sharing we left off on verse 6, so now he goes to the leaders. Um, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you? Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Um, oftentimes we ridicule Catholicism because of their admiration of the saints and there are even their prayer to the different saints for the different things that they need help with. Like they have a patron saint of toothaches and um, things like that, which we would say obviously is idolatry and taking that sort of uh, worship to an extreme. On the opposite extreme, however, it does say, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God and consider their outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. There are uh, different days in the church here that talk about um, different saints that aren't listed in the Bible, men that, that stood up for, or women that stood up for the word of God and maybe suffered martyrdom that maybe we in Lutheranism don't know about as much. And we're very hesitant to hold up on a pedestal anybody because we know they're sinners and we don't. And we're very leery of that, too, because of the hypocrisy that sometimes comes from people who are supposed to be these great leaders and then fall flat on their face. That being said, there are faithful Christians that we can look up to and that we do want to imitate in their lives of faith. And he says, remember them and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. There is a, a reward even in this world, in a sense of living your life of faith faithfully, when it comes to, uh, you know, the devil can stick his nose in anywhere and, and cause problems in anybody's life ultimately, but there are also natural consequences of faithfully uh, using the word of God in your relationship or in the raising of your children or in your business where there are blessings there. And he says, imitate their faith. Think about your leaders that, that God has placed over you and uh, think about how they live their lives and imitate their faith. There's nothing wrong with that to have people that you look up to in the Christian faith and you say, I really admire so-and-so, knowing that they're still sinners, they still put their pants on one leg at a time, um, but they are good Christian people. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with recognizing good faithful service in God's kingdom. And maybe, you know, we don't do that enough or as much as we could or we should. He tells us to remember them and to think about how they're living and imitate their life, their faith. Paul even said that in his life, even though he, when he looked at his own life, he said, I'm a miserable sinner. I don't do the good I want to do. But he also said uh, that he was setting an example for the Christians in their faith. And you know, the, the opposite extreme, too, we have in today's day and age is people say, uh, I'm not a role model, or, uh, you know, I don't care what people think of me. That's a big one. I don't care what you think of me. And it's gone to the opposite extreme that anybody who wants to live a Christian life uh, 
is automatically judged as being pompous, hypocritical, those types of things. Well, maybe they're trying to set a good example too. And, uh, you know, you have to be careful that you don't judge all of them as just being uh, facial Christians or, um, uh, you know, people that are just trying to do it for show. And, um, you know, I think of, I might be wrong, but I think of Tony Dungy, for instance, I think is a good Christian example of a man uh, who was a coach for the Indianapolis Colts, who wasn't in your faith with his Christianity, but he was very strong. He is a very strong Christian. Uh, Tim Tebow is a little more flashy, I think, in my in my opinion, but, uh, you know, the other people might say he's one that they look up to. You know, you want to be careful that you don't judge again, but there's other people out there too, obviously, solid Christian people that are um, – not flamboyant about it, and yet strong with their faith. So he says, think about them. And then, of course, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, you might wonder, what does that have to do with all the other statements? Well, in Jesus, who never changes, you know that you have solid forgiveness. And Jesus is his personal name, and Christ is his anointed office. And he's, he's the one that saves, not the leaders. And you need Jesus if you're going to have somebody to never leave you or forsake you, it's Jesus. And he's the one who makes you content. He's the one who can bless your marriage. He's the one you ultimately look up to uh, and look to for your salvation. So it's kind of a climax of those. Don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest uh, carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. So he starts with more admonitions, strange teachings. We still have strange street teachings that can carry people away yet today. Uh, people talk about visions that they've had from the Lord, uh, all kinds of, if you turn on the TV, you can see all kinds of uh, strange things out there. You might think of the, um, there was a Heaven's Gate cult years ago that thought that the hale Bob Comet was going to come and save people, so they all drank, ate some poisoned uh, uh, applesauce, and they had their bags all packed, thinking that Jesus was on the back of that comet as they, they killed themselves. Jim Jones, um, strange teachings out there, um, using Jesus in a sense. But it's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. Um, not by ceremonial food. So he makes a contrast to Jesus' ministry to the priests. Um, in, uh, he talks about the blood um, that's, again, and we think of Leviticus uh, 16, verse 27. Oops, uh, didn't work. Hold on a second. Leviticus 16. Here it talks about the blood uh, was brought into the most holy place to make atonement and must be taken outside the camp. Their hides, flesh, and offal are to be burned up. So they would sacrifice the animal, take the blood into the most holy place, and then take the animal outside of the camp to burn it um, outside. And that was a reminder, reminder that the sins of the people were being removed as that body was burned up. Um, in this case here, we're told to go outside the camp and we think of how Jesus was, was crucified outside the camp and the altar we have to eat from, we could think of as the Lord's Supper, which we eat from of the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. But then we also think of Jesus who suffered on Golgotha right outside the city gate. Why? To make the people holy through his own blood. There's the holiness again. And how do we have it? Through Jesus, God's own blood. 
and how do then we go to him outside the camp. So outside the camp of uh, the Jewish religion, uh, the, the Israelite religion, the Old Testament religion that rejected Jesus as their savior, you go out there and that means persecution, that means disgrace. The Christians back in, in this day, he's talking to Jewish Christians, were, were despised and rejected by their own Jews and they were also then persecuted by their government. So their own family members, their own, their own race, they were all just uh, bore for disgrace when they became Christian. Uh, but he mentions that it's worth the trip outside that camp because you're looking forward to the city that is to come. So it's a, again, it's an encouragement. Don't leave the faith. Don't leave the faith. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continue to offer God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And don't forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pre praised, is pleased. So a different kind of sacrifice of the lips that praise his name, his reputation. So God flows into our lives so that we can overflow to other people's lives. You don't have to offer the animals anymore. You offer your lips, you offer your actions, you offer good to people and share with people. So a final admonition on, on how to live a Christian life through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ with the sacrifice of praise to others. Verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Obey is a little stronger than submit. Um, we don't like the word submit either. Uh, which leaders is he talking about? He's talking about pastors. Uh, so there is authority that is supposed to go along with the pastorate, um, where you have somebody that's assigned to look over you, to watch over you as a parent over a child spiritually. Who must give an account? Who must we give an account to? God, okay? So there's a high responsibility. Uh, a friend of mine had a babysitter, watch his, his daughter when, when she was younger, and somehow something happened where uh, I don't know if she was holding the child and tripped on the stairs, but the child uh, broke her arm. And so imagine getting that phone call from a parent that while you were babysitting their child, somehow your child broke his or her arm. Um, or you see also videos of people in, uh, in nursing homes in Michigan who are being abused by the very people that are supposed to take care of the parents that they love and how much anger you would have over your parents being abused, punched, uh, thrown into bed, slapped. Uh, you would have a special anger toward those workers and that, and that whole system, that whole nursing home for the abuse that your parents or your children went through. Now think about God then who says, here's the children that I died for that I've baptized into the faith, and I want you pastors to take care of them. You must give an account. So what does that mean? We need to properly provide the word of God and the sacrament for you. We need to properly discipline people when they go astray. Uh, but we also need to be careful that we don't abuse our authority. This has happened in so, much, so many uh, churches where you know the leaders are put on such a pedestal that they cover up the sins of their leaders and uh, not to be too overly uh, judgmental of the, the, those within Catholicism, but you do think of the priests who, who got away with such awful abuse of children in their care and then how they were moved from one rectory to another. Uh, and that's an awful thing that if they do not repent, Think about them standing before God on Judgment Day for how many children they abused and, and how they, they just abused their position. But that this isn't really the main point here. He is saying that these men are accountable, but what is the role of those who have leaders to obey them and submit to their authority? So that, why? So that their work will be a joy, not a burden. Uh, so one reason is that they have to give account. The second reason is so that their joy is, a, is, is a, their work is a joy, not a burden. And, you know, there's both sides of that in the parish ministry. 
Uh, it's wonderful to work with good Christian people who support a pastor, say, I'm praying for you. Thank you for your work. And we get more than, more than that than anything else. But there are also those sheep that, that like to, uh, let's say, dig in their heels against the pastor, ridicule him for doing one thing or another, or, you know, just ignore everything he tells them to do, whether it be in a marriage or in their relationship with church and they're coming to worship that can be very burdensome at time. And you hear about pastoral uh, people resigning from, from the ministry, not as much as it was a few years ago because they've become more conscious of pastoral burnout. Uh, but that would be of no advantage to you if your pastor is miserable and a congregation, you have some vocal minority perhaps in a congregation that just makes his life miserable. Um, you have to be careful for that because that doesn't help you any if your pastor is miserable. Um, if you don't want to follow any of his guidance, if you just treat him kind of like an idiot or whatnot, or that you can ignore him at every, at every point, he, he wants to lead, if he's a good, loving leader, he'll want to lead you on the right pathway, and it doesn't help your church at all. If there's a rift between the pastor and the, and, the, and the members of the congregation, and people coming to visit then can notice if there's a rift in the congregation, you can kind of smell it in the air when there's trouble like that. And um, thankfully, I haven't had to deal with that hardly at all in my ministry. I had one uh, vacancy I had to serve out in Kansas where there was just a terrible relationship uh, between the members of the congregation. And walking into that church uh, on a Sunday was like walking into a landmine. And then they would want to pull you right in the middle of the argument. And that church ended up disbanding not surprisingly, because they just couldn't get along. It was an awful situation. And those are difficult on pastors, uh, but thankfully I've not had that in my own congregation that I've served at in any place for 25 years, so I'm thankful for that. But this is a fourth commandment issue here that he's talking about in the relationship between the pastor and the congregation, and he's wanting that to go well. All right, so we're gonna conclude here with 18 through 25. Uh, any comments or questions up to this point? It's going to let me keep talking here. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's go back then. Here we go. Last chunk. Here we go. Uh, finishing out Hebrews. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. Uh, I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now, the writer uh, may have been ridiculed in some way, but he had a clear conscience, and he needed their prayers. And, you know, when, when you hear that from members that I'm praying for you, that's a wonderful thing. You know, sometimes you have the shut-ins who don't think they can do anything because they can't serve like they used to. And I say to them, pray for me, pray for us. Their prayers are coveted and they're needed. And we don't know exactly, again, where this, this uh, servant of the Lord was, but he wanted to be restored to them soon. So he said, let's leave this in the Lord's hands and uh, let's uh, live an honorable life here that, uh, that we need your prayers. So that's always a good thing. Now, a beautiful blessing here that reflects on the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. We think of Psalm 23, um, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, I use, this blessing is used oftentimes in funerals, uh, at the burial site, I believe it is, at the committal. And we use this one. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, bought, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So first of all, what a wonderful description to call him the God of peace. The God who wants to bring peace in our hearts and the God who brought peace with himself and humanity through the blood of the eternal covenant. It's not a temporary covenant. It's not one that only lasts for a hundred years or a thousand years. It's an eternal covenant through that bloodshed brought back Jesus from the dead. 
so the resurrection, uh, which is uh, the resurrection of Jesus specifically, mentioned for the first time here in this letter, is again the basis for our hope the great shepherd of the sheep. How is he going to shepherd us into heaven into the most holy place through his death and his resurrection? And, and what do we need this God of peace to do who already opened heaven for us through the blood of the great shepherd? He will equip you. May he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. So he's got to be the one working in us, right? So he doesn't just leave us on our own and say, here, go at it, have a good luck. He says, may he, God, the good shepherd, work in us what is pleasing to him. How? Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So to Jesus be the glory. And if he wants Jesus to have the glory, then he must be God, right? Um, so all of this goes back to him when he works in us what is good and pleasing to him. Um, I have a cross-reference written down here from Revelation 7, verse 17. The lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Another picture of the good shepherd leading us to springs of living water. That's the word of God, the sacrament that ultimately then leads us into heaven. So here we have that same picture in this blessing here. He has to equip us for doing good, not just the law, but the gospel of Christ. And finally, brothers, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written you only a short letter. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those from Italy send your greetings. Grace be with you all. So it makes you wonder if uh, those from Italy were sending greetings back to Rome and they were dispersed at this time. And he talks about Timothy coming back to them soon. And here, what a nice way to end the, uh, end the letter. Grace be with you all. And that's what we need, God's grace in Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, the great high priest who made the sacrifice and died the death for our sins. So we made it through the book of uh, Hebrews, a wonderful book there. Um, any final questions or comments on the book? Look forward to um, the next one we get to see in person, right? Ah, there you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, we'll, <laughs> Thank we'll, we'll, you. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, we'll see what happens uh, uh, with this. And uh, maybe we can do another online one too, but also do one live as well. So. Online is cool, you know. Yeah, it's pretty handy. Really not wearing pajamas, honest. <laughs> <laughs>